Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I am Yildiray Yildirim, the director of Stephen L. Neyman Real Estate Institute here at Baruch College. We are happy to have you here to participate and share in this EB5 conference with Monosha and Associate Global, David uh, Herson Partners, and the Stephen L. Neyman Real Estate Institute. Thank you all for coming. Today we are bringing you all day event that is all about EB5. We, will, we, we all know that there are many challenges when working with EB5 investment. In addition to the cloud of uncertainty surrounding reforms and the renewal of the program. And today's panel will eliminate these issues and discuss how you can succeed within the current environment. Our panelists will discuss legislative updates to the EB-5 program, red flags that you may encounter in a project, rural versus urban projects, funding sources, and infrastructure. You will also hear from the representative from the USCIS Immigrant Investor Program Office. In particular, I would like to thank uh, our special guest from the US, uh, USCIS, uh, uh, Julia Harrison, Janelle Murray, Jan Leons, Richard Mur Murray, Kristen uh, Rattigan, and Chet Breaker. Each of today's panels promises to interesting and enlightening. Before we call for the first panel, I would like to say one more time, you're welcome and thank you. And then I'll leave the floor to Mona. Thank you, Yildre. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning to everybody who's here and who's watching. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here again um, at Baruch, and we have a wonderful panel, so I'm not going to waste very much time because we have an awful lot that we want to speak about. Um, I'm going to ask each of the panel members to introduce themselves briefly. No, <laughs> no seriously. Um, so I will start at the end uh, with Leon Rodriguez. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Leon Rodriguez. I am a uh, partner at Seifarth Shaw. Uh, until January of this year, I was the director of US Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, and that came following a career as a federal prosecutor. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Angel? Uh, well, you really I'm don't not, need I'm too much. I'm because you, you had such a, a brief introduction. It was <laughs> such an understatement of who you are. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to match that. Uh, Angel Bruner, I'm president and founder of EB5 Capital. I've been in the industry about 10 years. Uh, we uh, have investments all over the country, across all asset classes, and we have clients from over 50 countries. Thank you. Manuel? Yes, my name is Manuel Ortiz. I am the head of EB-5 for Civitas Capital. We're based out of Dallas, Texas. Um, we've raised over $600 million in EB-5 funds. We also have a non-EB-5 division that's raised $600 million uh, as, as well. So total, we're about $1.2 billion, and our projects stretch throughout the United States. Thank you. Jean? Hi, I'm May. May cough a, a little bit, but uh, I'm uh, Jeannie Calderon. I've been a professor at NYU Stern School of Business for over 30 years. Um, I uh, teach all aspects of law, ethics, and uh, with Gary Friedland, who is my husband uh, of almost 40 years, uh, we have uh, uh, created a course uh, by the name of Real Estate Transactions that we teach in uh, uh, undergraduate, graduate, law students, uh, and through that, those courses, we uh, gained knowledge and interest, and uh, since gaining knowledge in, of, of the EB-5, we have been engaged in maybe uh, three years of uh, a lot of research and writing uh, on the field. Uh, so. Thank you. <coughs> Gary, would you like to say a word? <laughs> she speaks for me. Well, uh, they've all understated themselves. I can tell you that um, we are very honored to have such a, uh, a panel here. And I know that everybody is dying to know what is going on, because that is the title of today's <coughs> um, uh, panel, Legislative Updates, EB-5 and the Regs. So we're going to start, for the people who are really not sure, you, you hear names which are thrown out, uh, the various players. Um, I'm going to ask Angel. Angel, who are the players currently out there at this point? Uh, which game? <laughs> uh, le legislative? Um, wh wh the EB-5 legislative football okay. game, yes. 
Uh, <laughs> let's see. So we have IIUSA, Invest in the USA, for which I'm uh, on the board of directors. And so is uh, Dan Healy from Civitas. And uh, I would say that's a major player, right. a major player in terms of policy guidance for the legislative process and has been uh, throughout the reauthorization conversation, which I would say is not just this year. I would say it's really just been the past four years that we've been having the same conversation, and I think we're going to get there this year. There's the EB-5 Investment Coalition, which is a little bit newer than IIUSA. Uh, it's about two years old, for which I'm the uh, membership chair and spokesperson, and that represents uh, a broad spectrum of regional centers and actors. IIUSA has a number of affiliate members, so in addition to regional centers, I would say IIUSA represents lawyers, uh, overseas uh, finders, and uh, other service providers in the industry. Uh, the third player, I would say, is the Real Estate Roundtable. Uh, the Real Estate Roundtable for this is kind of funny. You probably know this, Mona, which is probably why I'm sitting here. I'm also a member of the Real Estate Roundtable. Uh, that's an a, a invitation-only uh, group of 150 real estate CEOs from around the country, and uh, it represents, as you can imagine, all of the uh, major real estate developers in the country that happen to use EB-5. So they're new to the conversation. They've entered the conversation since we now have large developers that are involved. Uh, the fourth group that is also very powerful, uh, which is probably the most powerful small business lobby in the country, is the Chamber of Commerce, uh, for which I am also a member. Um, so uh, that group, uh, which represents a large swath of immigration issues for folks from Marriott to Walmart to, uh, to uh, small business chapters all over the country, uh, that, that group is also involved. And then the, f the fifth group is the Rural Alliance, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a group of uh, regional centers that have largely non-urban interests. And I say non-urban versus rural because, uh, you know, there's really urban and then there's, uh, not to uh, uh, understate it, but there's everything else. And so... Uh, so the Rural Alliance really does a very good job of representing those interests. What's interesting about the conversation right now, which has not been true before, is all of those groups are in agreement. Uh, we have all... That's rare. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And, it took and two years to get to the stage. Yeah, and Mona can really sort of put more <laughs> emphasis on that, and, 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 and Leon probably can too. And, and uh, the, I, I cannot emphasize enough how unique that is to our moment in time right now, which is what gives me the most hope that we will actually reach uh, a conclusion with the legislative process. Now, who are the players on the legislative side? Uh, we have... Uh, uh, friends and foes in both uh, the House and the Senate. Uh, we have Grassley, uh, Senator Grassley, who chairs the judiciary for the Senate committee. Uh, he is uh, buffered by Jeff Sessions and Steve Miller. Um, you probably recognize that trio as a very consistent anti-immigration trio uh, in in the conversation right now. And 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 uh, Senator Grassley is uh, certainly. Uh, uh, staying true to that in, in the things he's asking for uh, with reforms for the EB-5 program. Uh, on the friend side, on the Senate, we have Senator Cornyn uh, and Senator Flake, uh, who have been uh, incredible champions of the program, uh, first led, I would say, by Civitas. Uh, Civitas first introduced Cornyn to Senator Cornyn to, uh, to the industry, and we have since uh, befriended him as an industry and he's been an undying champion. For those of you who don't uh, follow Washington politics, which I hope that's most of you, uh, <laughs> Senator Cornyn is the second most powerful senator in the Senate. He is uh, second to um, Senator McConnell, uh, and so uh, he, he's an incredible champion for us to have. Uh, so we're very happy with that. On the House side, uh, we... I wouldn't say we have anyone who's uh, as strong a friend as we have on the Senate side, but we do have allies, uh, and Speaker Ryan is one of them. Uh, uh, McCarthy is another one. And so what's important about that is that we have leadership's attention, and it's very important in this, in this Congress to have leadership's attention, more important than it is to have any particular member of the House. And then on the uh, not-so-friendly side, we have 
Congressman Goodlatte, which I'm pleased to say has announced his retirement yesterday. So, um, <laughs> yes, exactly. I wish I could say I had something to do with that, but I don't. I cannot um, take credit for it, but I can celebrate it. Uh, and so, uh, we, uh, and, and then the other sort of shadow character uh, that doesn't really have any particular champion or, or, or person behind it other than Senator Grassley are the regulations. And, and I introduced that as an actor because the, that, that, that pending, uh, the pending aspect of the regulation sits in every conversation we have about what to do about the legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. And we're going to come back to the regulations in a big way shortly. Uh, but really, um, Manuel, I know you saw, Civitas have a lot to do with what's going on. They've helped tremendously in, the, um, in bringing in legislation. But you also travel widely. What are you seeing with this stalemate? Um, for two years, we've had this stalemate as far as uh, new legislation is concerned. Right, and so I would say in just getting feedback from uh, intermediaries and just talking to some of the uh, investors ourselves, uh, over the course of the last few years, there's been the looming changes coming, um, and you've had different deadlines, and I think the fact that sometimes it seems like the goal, goalposts keep, uh, kept uh, moving back, um, I wouldn't say that you lose some credibility at the fact that the investment amount's going to go up, uh, TA is going to change. Um, but people just start kind of wondering, is, is this really going to happen? And so I think one of the things that has been one of the major concerns just throughout the world has been that the investment amount would change. And I do think that is going to have a dampening effect on the demand. Um, and so I would think just we as, re as uh, regional centers would also be working with a smaller pool of, uh, of investors. Now, I think that's going to be very important for the projects that are out there because um, the smaller pool of investors is also uh, very important because other countries, which are the emerging markets such as India, uh, Latin America, don't have the infrastructure that China did. And so in, in the case of China, the infrastructure to distribute EB-5 exists there. In other countries, that does not exist. And so because of that, uh, the timing to fund for certain projects is going to be a lot longer. And so I think that definitely does have to coincide with the uh, type of projects that, that are out there and also just the different perspectives uh, and preferences that uh, investors have in different uh, parts of the world and how they perceive uh, projects. That's right. Um, but Angel, uh, Manuel, what are you seeing as far as uh, you know the legislation going through? There is a very good chance, or do you see there is a good chance of the regs coming in um, if there isn't a deal? Uh, I would say two things there. One, uh, I agree with Manuel that the, they're moving the goalposts, that we've been incredibly cooperative as an industry. We've been cr incredibly uh, aligned as an industry, more so than ever before, Mona, as you mentioned. Yeah. And as we agree, they bring up new things for us to agree on. Uh, so there's definitely a feeling over the past three months that the goalposts keep getting moved and that there are people who are actively trying to run out the clock and have more interest in the regulations coming into play than actual uh, reform and legislation through the legislative process. So uh, that that is a factor. Um, we are doing everything we can as an industry uh, across all of those groups to get to a legislative solution, but we have not seen any draft legislative language, uh, and, and the clock is running. running. Yeah, we so, have till April of next year. Right, so even if we agree on 10 issues, uh, it really doesn't matter uh, if we don't start drafting legislation. So, so that is critical, and that's something everyone in this room can do, is to encourage their congressmen to uh, to uh, push for draft draft language, uh, but the regs uh, the the regs uh, have a process to go through. Right. They have to go to OMB. They have not actually started that process, so uh, we we do have some time. I think it's highly unlikely that we will we will be governed by the regs anytime soon. Well, that's a matter of opinion, I think, from what, what we've been hearing. Leon, yep. um, I know you're of the opinion that perhaps the regs may not come in because you are aware of all the formalities that have to go through. Well, and, and I've also been, been <coughs> watching the, the political dynamic that began uh, while I was still uh, director. So just to, to sort of remember the timing 
uh, of what happened was the, the legislation was about to sunset. Uh, Senator Grassley uh, had a number of what I would characterize as sort of program integrity questions about the EB-5 program, sent a very long, very detailed letter uh, demanding all kinds of reform. Uh, so right about the spring of 2016, we began the process of drafting uh, the, the regulation. There was all kinds of stakeholder uh, input. Uh, that then is followed by, one, the election outcome, which obviously shifts, uh, shifts the players, uh, but two, the fact that the regulation uh, sunsets, I'm sorry, the law is rather sunsets and is extended repeatedly. Uh, and what the regulation has become as a result uh, is more of a, a bargaining lever in the legislative process uh, than really a reality in and of itself. And I think I would hasten to point out uh, two other players that I would add to the mix uh, in terms of uh, Angel's Array, uh, which is one, the leadership of USCIS. Uh, and it's important to understand that the leadership of USCIS is almost the same as Chuck Grassley, in the sense that uh, the head of the Office of Policy at USCIS, Kathy newell Kavarik. Uh, was a senior staffer for Chuck Grassley until she was appointed over at USCIS. Uh, she has really been determining a lot of the policy direction for USCIS. And the director who was confirmed just three weeks ago uh, was somebody who was detailed from the Department of Homeland Security uh, to USCIS. That means that his views, uh, if nothing else, uh, will have a lot of access to the internal process at USCIS. But there's another uh, player within the, within the executive branch that cannot be ignored, and that is the bureaucracy itself, uh, the, investor, uh, uh, the, the Immigrant Investor Office, the IPO, which you all know. Um, they have somewhat different priorities than the political process. They want, a, they, they want, a, uh, they want a law that they can actually administer. Uh, they don't want to have things keep changing, so they don't want to issue a regulation today only to find that there is a law three months later uh, that overtakes what that regulation says. Um, all of those dynamics for me spell that for the foreseeable future, the regulation will continue to be a bargaining lever, uh, but something for which there is not presently active intention in the executive branch. And I don't know, I'm not in there anymore, people don't talk to me, I'm just observing the dynamics from the outside. <laughs> Uh, uh, which is that it is basically functioning as, as a lever. Now, to Mona's question about the actual process, um, it will need to go over to the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, uh, picture uh, the BQE on a bad day. Uh, that is the line of regulations waiting to be approved. Uh, so unless that regulation is one where the White House, in other words, the President or his immediate staff, have said this regulation is a priority that must jump to the front of the line, uh, that regulation will wait there for a while uh, before it's actually cleared for issuance, not to mention that pretty significant questions might be asked about that regulation uh, during the course of the, of the process. If the regulation is actually issued, there are then another 30 days, a minimum of 30 days, before which that regulation can become effective and this is another place where the bureaucracy becomes very important. The bureaucracy wants enough time from the time that that regulation is issued to the time that it becomes uh, uh, um, uh, actually in effect to be able to be ready, meaning it needs to train uh, the adjudicators to be ready to handle uh, the cases. Uh, they, issue, they need to issue external guidance uh, to the industry in order to be able to comply. Uh, there's a number of things, they need to change forms, there's a number of things that they need to do, which means that that 30 days often becomes 60, 90, and even 120 days. So there's, uh, again, my prediction is that we're still going to be dealing mostly with the legislative process rather than the regulatory process. Leon, um, whenever I travel, um, and, and I know Manuel faces the same, people ask us, oh, can they close down the EB-5 program? And we explain that, no, the EB-5 program itself is in law, but the regional center program is not. Um, and in your opinion, I don't believe you believe that the regional center program can be closed down. Um, I don't believe it can be closed down. I think it can be gummed up plenty. Uh, in other words, I think that 
there are ways that you can, in fact, I think we've seen in different uh, immigration, uh, not, not just the EB-5 world, but if you look at what's happening in the other parts of the employment-based world, um, there is a lot that you can do in the adjudicative process that will slow an industry down. So it may not shut it down, uh, and I don't think they can shut it down or will shut it down, um, but there is plenty that can be done to sort of really inhibit uh, activity within an industry. Mm. Well, I'll come back uh, to this point in a second, uh, in a few <coughs> minutes, Leon. Um, Jean and Gary, you <coughs> both have spent an awful lot of effort, time, um, thought power, brain power in examining how um, EB-5 EB financing has really benefited <coughs> the community and what improvements can be done. How do you see, uh, if we get the regulations coming in as opposed to legislation, how do you see that affecting um, the, the infrastructure which is already out there? I think that, well, we actually released a paper in February right after the regulations were proposed. We're entitled Missed Opportunity. We believe that, we believe that, that while the idea of TEA reform is a good thing, the way that they approached it was, was possibly not the most prudent approach. The timing was poor, obviously. If, if regulations were proposed in the spring or summer of 2016, we think they never would have gone into effect, but it would have been the impetus for real negotiation and a compromise that would result in, in legislation similar to what's um, been offered by Senator Grassley now, maybe a little bit tougher. I think as a practical matter, um, by, by, the, by the delay, it, it invites the problems that uh, Leon just pointed out. So I think as a uh, practical matter, the more likely um, solution is that, that, or outcome, is that there will not be any um, reform in the current session. And I think the better um, approach by USCIS would be to simplify the regulations. And with one simple change, it would have, uh, I think, more likely facilitated a compromise and not be subject to the same kind of attack as is being uh, offered now. And the simple change would be to simply revoke the delegation of TEA authority for, uh, from the states and revert to what the statute provides, which is that USCIS makes that determination. You would then have a $500,000 million level. You wouldn't have to adjust the investment amounts. You wouldn't be facing and, and raising the same issues that are being raised now by what the impact of dramatic increases in the investment amounts would be. How, but how far do you feel that um, if, if they co the regulations come in as they currently stand, it's going to hurt big cities like New York City, of course? I think that it's, 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 it's certainly hard to measure the impact, but certainly when you increase dramatically the investment amounts, it's going to result in a reduction in, in the number of investors who can afford the program yeah. and will consider other options. On the other hand, Increasing the investment amount, not to quite the levels that were, that were offered in the regulations, which I think as a practical matter were, were offered more as a hammer and not really as a sincere targeted amount, particularly given that they were offered in the context of legislation that was pending, which offered investment amounts at that point of 800000 in the million. And that, even that, the reformers were unable to um, get past they knew there would be tremendous resistance. Mm -hmm. So it, but, uh, on the other hand, by increasing the investment amount, you're able to raise more investment dollars with fewer investors. Essentially, half, half the number of investors can raise the same amount of money, number one. And number two is it would have some, reduct, some um, positive impact on the long visa waiting line because you wouldn't have as many investors online to raise the same amount of money. As a practical matter, though, I think the, the million and eight, million 350 um, would have some kind of impact. Well, now I throw this out to the whole panel because the, the issue really is here. I've, this is what uh, I feel 
that um, all the people who get involved with legislation, they really don't understand the competition that the United States faces when uh, we go overseas. Because someone sitting, for example, in the UAE who wants to, uh, an expat sitting in the UAE who wants to come um, and live somewhere else in the world doesn't just have the United States. They have Australia, they have Canada, they have um, the UK, they have, uh, you know, the, basically all the whole world. And the United States is a unique program in the sense that your money is at risk. So whether it is feasible to allow somebody to put 1.8 million at risk with no guarantees and no promises, um, and whether you can really expect that you're going to get the same kind of numbers to fill up private business, um, I throw that open to the panel. I mean, yes. it's, it's, it's my opinion that if, and I agree with Gary, that if the investment amount increases to 800 and to a million, um, that might shrink the market a little bit, but not all that much. And I really do think that a lot of the stuff that's uh, putting the market on the fence right now are the processing time. So to Leon's point, there, there are things that, that can happen that can kind of suppress that, that market. And one of the things that we're seeing right now are just that the processing times are taking very long. And that uh, in and of, of, of itself is dampening some of that demand. And I think if you look at some of the emerging markets like Vietnam and India, who aren't at the delays that, say, uh, China is, they'll be there sometime within the next two to three years. And so that, again, can also dampen the, the uh, demand. One, one point that confuses me is that Angel points out that the industry I accepts the terms that have been offered by Senator Grassley, uh, which is quite different from what's been proposed in the past. And so the question is, what points are open? What points have, have has Senator Grassley, what, what new points has Senator Grassley imposed that are not acceptable to industry? Uh, well, uh, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> uh, because uh, they're new points. They're not the points that he originally asked us to accept. We accepted all those. Uh, the latest issue that uh, I think that we have violent disagreement on, and um, me especially, is uh, Senator Grassley would like to lower the job creation requirement. He would like to see, instead of us having to create 10 jobs, he would like to have us create five jobs uh, in uh, rural communities and, uh, and only 10 jobs in, in every place else. Uh, and if there's one tenant that I would like to preserve and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to do it, is the job creation uh, uh, opportunity that we have that's different than any other country. And so I've personally said that I, I won't accept that. And um, I'm happy to see that um, industry has followed my lead on that and that we're holding tight to that line. But that's probably the most offensive thing that Senator Grassley has come to us with since we agreed to everything. So for clarification purposes, there I don't, I don't know how many in the audience are familiar with the fact that Senator Grassley and uh, Congressman Goodlatte have issued a term sheet that you've actually written about um, that describes the, the new proposed terms, which includes that term, and that's been floating around for over a, a month or two. That's still, so as far as that being a new term, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. But as far maybe you sh should discuss what some of the new t uh, terms are. Right. Um, uh, well, Angel, the, right. the, 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 there was a proposal thrown out about a month ago. Um, uh, as to a last and final offer. Um, and it was like nothing is going to change after this offer. So that was the implication. Right, so there was an offer before that. Right. Um, to which we, there was a term sheet before that to which we agreed to. And then uh, once we agreed to that, then the new term sheet was circulated um, uh, with this additional term. I, I guess there's a, 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 a component of our community that would like to see that term. Um, that's in the minority. Yeah, that, I think the, 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 the five jobs issue, just for clarification, I think relates solely to rural projects, well, rural and urban distress. I don't think it, it's not across the board. So that's it correct. still remain ten, 10 jobs, one direct, nine indirect for yeah. non -t, so, so what we TEA. Right, so what we countered with was uh, we feel so strongly about job creation that we offered that you can have 10 for rural, but we'll increase the job requirement for everywhere else to 12. Uh, and, and that's how strongly we feel about the economic development component of the program and how 
uh, strongly we believe that we can meet that without any erosion of the capital that we can bring to a project. And well, well, sorry, Gary. Yeah, well, but as a practical matter, every project that qualifies for the 10 will qualify for the 12 because the market currently demands a job cushion of at least 20 percent. And the way that jobs are calculated is based in many cases, particularly for real estate development projects, on the amount of construction expenses. That really drives yeah, the I, calculation. So, you have, so you're creating temporary, con you're creating construction jobs in many cases. And I think Senator Grassley's uh, point is that in the case of rural projects, which don't have the opportunity to create as many construction type jobs, but, is tr but are trying to um, create m jobs in the manufacturing sector, it's not as easy to justify based on economic impact models that, uh, those number of jobs. It's actually the opposite. Um, what happens in a rural area is that the transport uh, cost and the number of ancillary inputs is increased because of the distance between inputs. And so what you have in rural areas, uh, for example, in our first project in Sugarbush, for every job we created at Sugarbush, we created three jobs in the Mad River Valley. And we don't get those kind of multipliers in urban areas because you don't have the same transport distances. So you actually have an opportunity for more jobs in rural areas. Secondly, um, we asked Senator Grassley's office to tell us just exactly what type of investments would require five jobs. What type of jobs would you be creating that you would need such a low job creation requirement? And they didn't answer the question. We eventually got an answer to the question, and we got a, a franchise answer. Now, I personally want to create high wage, living wage jobs, uh, and, and those don't uh, fit that definition to me. And so uh, I'm personally not interested in creating those jobs. I don't think that that's good for the community, not to mention the ancillary um, sort of uh, negative impacts of that kind of thing. I mean, you're talking about health issues, and you know, I just don't think those are the best jobs for us to create for those and communities. That, and that's actually a larger objection than, for example, the set-aside? Yes, absolutely. It's a deal breaker. Yeah, we should explain that in the latest um, proposal. <clears throat> 3,000 visas were put as set-asides. And uh, I think, um, um, Angel, you said that uh, what was not agreeable was the fact that um, if those set-asides weren't used, they were not allowed to roll over to the visas. The That's current right. visa capacity. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, Senator Grassley's office feels very strongly that they would like to see permanent set-asides, to which we uh, agreed to. Uh, the industry has agreed to permanent set-asides. Uh, and uh, we understand that um, we need to create some significant long-term advantages or competitive advantages for the rural communities so that they can compete. And we're, uh, we're committed to that. Uh, but we still want strong living wage jobs for those communities. We don't want to create just any job. We have the choice, and, and we want to exercise it. So if, um, again, going back to you, Leon, uh, we can't get into agreement. Regs come in. We don't like what's in the regs. Um, can the regs be challenged? Um, sure. I mean, I think uh, regs can always be challenged, uh, and, and, and the fact of challenging has, has uh, an impact. Um, you know, you can challenge that they're beyond the, uh, beyond the legislative authority. Uh, you can challenge that they're not based uh, in the record, uh, which is something I think you're going to see happening a fair amount, actually, uh, not just in the EB-5 world, but down the line. Um, so those are, you know, those are definitely tools that will be available. Now, it's unlikely that those challenges will necessarily stop the regs from going into effect. So you may be fighting for a long time. Uh, you know, while the regs are actually in effect. So that's something to consider whether you think the case to challenge them will be strong enough to actually stop them from going into effect. That's, we'll see how smart the lawyers turn out to be. So if somebody wants to yeah. keep the status quo and they allow, you know, we, they keep fighting, we keep having all these infightings, uh, like a filibuster in a way, um, and we come to April, uh, we go through the for procedures and formalities, regs are coming in, there isn't a way to retain the current status quo of 500,000 and what we currently see in the TEA? So one thing about the, the April date, I assume when people talk about the April date, they're talking about the, the date in the regulatory agenda. Right. Um, that is a purely notional date, just to be, just to be clear uh, uh, in terms of what that date means. That is, USCIS was asked 
what's your regulatory agenda? When, when do you think this reg will be ready to go? Uh, and that's the date that was put there. I have seen regs, uh, I, in fact, I have, I have run agencies uh, where regs have waited two years and even three years before they actually got issued. Uh, so I, mean, I think it's important to understand while that's there as a, as a target of sorts, uh, the reality is that <coughs> it could be, it could go way, well past that date uh, when it actually uh, gets issued. Um, Just a question on yeah. top of that. In, in your previous experience... Can you come get close to the mic? Yeah, sure. In your previous experience where it took that long, were those regs in contention or were those regs not in contention? Um, excellent question. And so in, in the particular case that I'm remembering, the, it actually was not a reg that was in contention. Rather, uh, this was part of a sort of uh, pre-election pause in the Obama administration where there was a concern about being perceived as issuing too many burdensome regulations, so we waited. I mean, that was, so that, the, the dynamic was somewhat different than the one we're talking about here. And is there, there's nothing in the uh, Administrative Procedure Act or any other type of law that requires that OMB actually act within any time frame? The, the main thing that, that I, is, is just once OMB gets it, uh, it's supposed to act within 90 days, but OMB doesn't have it right now. And again, OMB, for everybody to understand, conducts the regulatory review, they do the cost-benefit analysis, they ensure that the Administrative Procedure Act is being followed. So that's the one deadline that I'm aware of. I don't think there is a longer horizon deadline in terms of from date of um, proposed rule to actual issuance that there's a deadline that is an enforceable and deadline. And even if it were uh, enacted or, or finalized? then there would be the opportunity for industry possibly to resume negotiations with Congress to try to come up with a report. Absolutely, and again, this is where the Immigrant Investor Office becomes uh, a pretty important voice because I know, for example, if I was still director and you told me, today we're gonna issue this regulation, we're gonna begin to administer this regulation but six months from now, we're going to have a law that's going to change everything all over again. I, I, would, lay, I, I would have a lot of problems with that. So I think the, the professionals who will have to actually administer that uh, will, be, will, will very actively resist a situation where that scenario seems like something that will happen. Leon, um, Angel, what about uh, new visas, uh, visa issuances, um, or perhaps fixing the current situation whereby dependents get taken out of the current 10,000 cap? Has that come up in discussions? Do we have any room for negotiations? Yeah. Um, again, I'm, I, for reasons that I think everybody can understand, I'm outside of the, the legislative process. Um, I will observe a, a, an important dynamic that's going on. Uh, you have an administration that has, uh, first of all, supported the RAISE Act, which has created sort of this merit-based framework for immigration in the future, uh, has argued for lowering overall immigration to half the current levels. So whatever happens with this issue, and I have no, no specific knowledge on where this issue is going in terms of the counting of the dependents, uh, the fact is that the, the position, both of the executive branch and significant parts of the majority in Congress, has been toward reducing numbers just about everywhere else, which I think is going to make it very challenging, at least in the short horizon, uh, to really raise numbers in, in this world. Uh, and this is my soapbox moment where I say I actually think the numbers should be 10 times more without dependents even being counted for this to really realize its full benefit. Uh, and I'm going to say that at every conference I speak at for the next few years Amen. until it I actually agree. happens. Yeah. Could you but explain what the benefit would be to us, not to the the, ben, the, ben, the benefit is that you have, you look, you look at the Department of Commerce report, I think was looking at fiscal 13 and 14. You look at the, the levels of job creation. You look at the levels of cash infusion in, into the economy. Just, just looking at the levels of job creation, uh, we uh, are thrilled if we have a, a month where our unemployment rate drops by one-tenth of one percent. That's roughly, given our workforce size, somewhere between 200 and 250,000 jobs. That means that in those two years, the level of job creation that the, the Department of Commerce studied 
uh, amounted to about three months of positive job creation. Just, just as one measure of the benefit of the program, I think the benefits are much more than just job creation, not to mention all the indirect job creation. So it just basically brings more uh, uh, positive investment into, into our economy. So I, mean, I think that's why that kind of expansion uh, would be positive. I also take this moment, which is, I think the, the, the absence of state and local uh, economic development managers, state and local officials from conferences like this one is a big problem. Um, because the, they would be the most important political allies to this industry. I don't think they've been mobilized on the level they need to be. And Leon, I would uh, agree completely with, with what you just said on the local level. And Angel, your group does a very good job in, in, in putting projects together. And just on a micro level, in terms of what's happened in Dallas, one of the projects that we did a, a few years ago, it's one of our first projects, was a section in uh, Dallas that was very underdeveloped. Uh, it was some, somewhat of a place that you don't want to be in if it gets too late at night. And so uh, lenders were not lending in, in that area. And so that's where EB-5 came into play as a local economic development tool. And so uh, we helped the developer develop the first <coughs> full service hotel south of what's I-30 there since World War II. Well, since then, Dallas Police Department has located right across the street. It's transformed the area. It's a place where you do want to be at night because there's a lot of restaurants. It's got a very vibrant nightlife. And so I think those stories need to be told more, too, and totally agree on, on that uh, uh, local level uh, thing that you mentioned. Angel, but that needs to be uh, talked about in the context of TEA reform so that there truly will be motivation by the investors to invest in projects in those areas rather than in the safer areas that are less risky of their investment, where really the EB-5 capital is not making a difference. And, uh, and under the Grassley reform or offer, the TEA different, the, the TEA incentive will now be narrowed to $100,000. So effectively, mm -hmm. the TEA financial incentive is meaningless and the focus becomes the visa set asides. If I, I'm, I'm optimistic or, or, or I think that the, uh, there will be comprehensive immigration reform, and that will provide an avenue for EB-5 to gain more slots. If that's, a, that's the case, there, is no, that, there will be no incentive for TEA. So that's well, something just to be taken into account. Just in case people are not quite sure, is that the latest proposal was uh, figures at 925 for TEA and a million and 25, so only 100,000 difference. Oh. Um, is that what you meant? Um, uh, Angel, quickly, uh, integrity measures, are they being opposed? Are they being approved? No, I'm, I'm pleased to say, uh, you know, so I first asked USCIS to regulate us uh, to a greater extent in 2008, and I thought I was going to need a security escort from the room for, uh, <laughs> from my uh, fellow EB-5 operators. Uh, but I come from an institutional background, and so uh, for folks like us and for folks like Civitas, the world won't change. Uh, with integrity measures, my life, you know, my life at 9 a.m. the day before and 9 a.m. the day after. How are they identical. being? How are they being viewed? Uh, any they're, opposition? They're being viewed uh, very, uh, very positively by all the different industry groups. Um, we seem to be now. This the caveat to this is we have not seen draft legislation, so we're talking about agreeing on language that was in the Flake Bill agreeing on language that's in the Cornyn bill. We're not actually talking about agreeing on language as it will be proposed to us, but given the past language that's been proposed to us, we're largely in agreement, and we've actually come to them and said, hey, your language is good, but it's not great. We actually want it to be stronger because some of the uh, more recent incidences of fraud would not be deterred by your language. And so we've actually asked them to strengthen it in certain areas in terms of reporting and monitoring and oversight. Gary, you had a point? Yeah, I, I think that Senator Cornyn is the wrong person to be Any leading, person? to be lead, I think Senator Cornyn is the wrong person to be leading that, that front because the one, the one provision in the, in the uh, reform bills, most recently the reform bill proposed by, um, by Chairman Goodlatte, pardon the expression, um, <laughs> is, it, it was, it was, he introduced a provision that was aimed specifically at curbing the, the JPEG anti-fraud abuse. 
And when could, Senator could you detail, Cornyn, could, when, you, could you detail the language that you yeah, were Yeah, I'll to? detail it in a second. Um, I'm happy to. Um, as far as the uh, Senator Cornyn in, in, in the spring, he, he circulated a draft bill, it wasn't introduced, but it was a draft bill circulated to the stakeholders, and that eliminated the provision that's, that, that Representative Goodlot um, proposed. And Representative Goodlot's provision was really aimed to, to deter fraud, to detect, detect it early, and then to, to enhance the discovery. The way the system is right now, USCIS doesn't get involved to tracking the flow of funds until the I-829 stage, which, as you know, in many cases is at least four years down the road, if not longer. So there's no mechanism to control the funds. And if you look at the, the various SEC actions, um, that, that's, that's a common theme that would have been curbed by something that, Senate, that Representative um, Goodlatte proposed, which was two alternatives. The most recent one of which was to um, require an independent fund administrator who would uh, sign off on the, the transfer of funds and be a so possibly a co-signatory on that to require that there be separate accounts, not the co-mingling accounts, rather than end up with the type of situations you have in JP, where a spaghetti diagram really represents what the flow of funds are that's so convoluted, rather than just going escrow to, from the investor to the escrow to the NCE to JCE, it follows a, a circuitous path throughout the world. So that's something that was eliminated in the Cornyn proposal. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm very curious to see whether that survives in a, a bill that, that may get introduced. Mm, thank you, Gary. Um, uh, Angel, Leon, do we have a dictator in uh, Senator Grassley? Um, and is there any <coughs> challenge from the leadership? No. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 this is a very influential and, and powerful senator, and I think he is a, he does have some potential to be a, a veto of one. I don't know that I would necessarily characterize him as a dictator, but I, I mean, I do think he is a, uh, he, ha he has created a space where he has a veto power, uh, an almost disproportionate veto power over, over what's going to be happening here. Mm. Angel? I don't think he has veto power, actually. I think that he has created certainly a fiefdom in terms of uh, the, the appointment of Kathy uh, Newbold, uh, and that he has a- And he, Cisna. He, yeah, yeah, and Cisna, Cisna and yeah. he has created a, an incredible amount, a, a disproportionate amount of influence, but that uh, at the end of the day, that uh, if, if, he, if he continues to, uh, sort of use the regs as a lever to extract more and more concessions from the industry that I don't actually think that will end well uh, for him because of the process of the, the literal process of the regulations and then our, our legal avenues to, uh, to oppose the regulations. So I don't, think, um, I, I don't think the power equation that he's working with will actually uh, uh, and the way that, that he would like it to, if, if he were a dictator. So and, and can leadership override? Can, yes, technically, yes. Right. Yeah, agree. so agreed. Yeah. We, yeah. we are running out of time very, very rapidly, have run out, but I do want to open the floor for uh, any questions. Yes. yes. Uh, question was, sorry, why would you... That's a great question. Um, it's a it's a it's a philosophical opposition to the lowering of any lowering job creation requirement for the program. It's it's independent of rural or urban, um, without a economically defensible argument as to what jobs are you creating and why would you need to do that, which Senator Grassley's office did not provide. There's no opportunity for us to support the lowering of jobs. Give us an economic argument and we'll consider it. We haven't been given one. Lack of economic opportunity in rural areas, not lack of jobs. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So that is why we are supporting the set-aside program and the permanent set-asides, because we want rural areas to have a permanent um, economic advantage in raising EB-5 funds. And a follow-up question on related to this. We have been always following investing in job creation and real estate development, hotels and other real estate development projects. Why don't we change the emphasis on creating manufacturing jobs to curb Sorry, hi, can you, the, the can you use the, is, the mic? Would you is mind right going there. to the mic, yeah. sir? Do, how many follow up uh, questions do you want to offer? Mm -hmm. Loud enough. <laughs> I always ask. Uh, the emphasis has always been in investing in job creation in the real estate industry, be it hotels, be it residential, be it office. The emphasis should ch also spread to creating green jobs in green energy creation, clean energy manufacturing. Why not change the direction or make the emphasis in changing the direction to spread the investments from just real estate investment and job creation to manufacturing job creation? With, with respect, I don't think the investments are just real estates. We, you know, we have many projects where they, we are not talking about just real estates. There are manufacturing, there are alternative. Uh, type of projects, um, infrastructure, transportation, agriculture. So it isn't just in real estate, um, but I, I see your point, the if anybody wants to answer. Real I've been doing it for well, years. real estate has hijacked uh, the EB-5 um, program, but <laughs> it's, it isn't intended just for real estate, and there are not just real estate projects, and we've had a lot of success in non-real estate projects as well. Um, there's somebody at the back. Yes, could you take the mic, please? I know everybody thinks they uh, think we, we can hear you, but we want to make sure everyone can hear you. Well, you can't see me from behind that thing. <laughs> Hi, Ozzy Torres, how are Hi, you? Ozzie. Thank you, everyone. You've done a marvelous job. So we all understand that there are various players right now trying to get this done. Um, what role does the Chamber of Commerce play, and, and are they a stranglehold right now? I, I would say no, as someone who's deeply involved in the conversations on a weekly basis. Uh, everyone is incredibly cooperative right now. It's a different world than it was two years ago. Um, everyone is incredibly cooperative. That's, that's all I could say, that there, there are no outliers. I, I think everybody's in agreement that we want this program to succeed and we want this program to move forward. Yes? <laughs> all right, uh, any last questions? Yes. You were saying earlier Can you take the mic, please? Sorry. You were saying earlier that it's for, it's for the recording. <laughs> you were saying earlier that there was an issue with the regs, um, with and you were earlier saying that it's it's going to expire April of uh, 2018, but there's a likelihood it's going to be renewed. With that being said. What regs are you referring to, or is it going to be universal with regs, regs A, or primarily what I'm more interested in is reg D? Um, okay, I, I think we're, we're not talking just about um, uh, the security regulations. What we're talking about here, the regulations which were introduced by USAIS. They were primarily yeah. aimed at, they, they were issued on January 13th, this year, and they were primarily aimed at TEA reform, but right. not only. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to our panel, and thank you to our audience.